أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وراودته التي هو في بيتها عن نفسه وغلقت الأبواب وقالت هيت لك قال معاذ الله إنه ربي أحسن مثواي إنه لا يفلح الظالمون ولقد همت به وهم بها وهم بها لولا أضأ برهان ربه كذلك لنصرف عنه السوء والفحشاء إنه من عبادنا المخلصين واستبق الباب وقدت قميصه من دبر وألف يا سيدها لدى الباب قالت ما جزاء من أراد بأهلك سوءا إلا إلا أن يسجن أو عذاب أليم قال هي راودتني عن نفسي وشهد شاهد من أهلها إن كان قميصه إن كان قميصه قد من قبل فصدقت وهو من الكاذبين وإن كان قميصه قد من دبر فكذبت وهو من الصادقين فلما رأى قميصه قد من دبر قال إنه من كيدكن إن كيدكن عظيم يوسف أعرض عن هذا واستغفري لذنبك إنك كنت من الخاطئين بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه أما بعد So we were discussing the section of سورة يوسف in which the wife of Aziz was tempting and was attempting to seduce Yusuf alayhi salam. And we mentioned that the murawada is a continuous verb which means that she was attempting to seduce, she was attempting to flirt, she was attempting to persuade. وَرَاوَدَتُ الَّتِي هُوَ فِي بَيْتِهَا The one in whose house Yusuf was. And as we mentioned last week, this is a very powerful phrase. Allah didn't say the wife of Aziz tempted him. Allah says the one in whose house Yusuf was tempted him. And as we all know, the temptation, generally speaking, it is a man that attempts to seduce a woman. Generally speaking, it is a man who opens up the flirtation with the woman. And it is very rare that the woman is the one who begins uh, this act. And when it does happen, then it is very difficult. Psychologically, it is very difficult for the man to say no. And in this case, the master, the wife of Aziz, the one in whose, in whose house Yusuf was, began to continue to seduce him until finally when she attempted to do the very deed itself and she said, I am ready for you, hey talak. And some scholars said this is a phrase that simply means uh, uh, in a vulgar way, come on or, or let's do it. Or another, uh, another interpretation, the word hayta is confusing as I said. Another interpretation is that hayta means I am ready for you. I have prepared everything for you. Yusuf sought refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he mentioned that Allah has protected him so far. Innahu rabbi ahsana mathwai. We said the strongest opinion, rabbi here does not refer to the, uh, why, the husband of uh, uh, of the one who's seducing him. It doesn't refer to his master. It refers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, she desired him and he desired her. 
And we said that so many scholars of the past, they said this is very problematic. How could Yusuf desire her? Uh, yet the fact of the matter is that human psychology dictates that the average human being, the average male, the average person in this situation would be tempted. And the fact that he rose above the temptation is what is praiseworthy for Yusuf alayhi salam. And the Prophet ﷺ said a very important hadith which we forgot to or we didn't have time to quote last time. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever hamma, whoever intends to do a sin, but he stops himself from doing it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will write for him a reward instead of the sin. So intending to do a sin and then stopping yourself from doing it is in fact something that is praiseworthy. Now we're not talking about somebody who wants to do a sin and then something comes between him and the sin. So for example, he wanted to commit an evil, he's driving to commit the evil, the cop pulls him over for a speeding ticket and he cannot do what he wanted to do. We're not talking about that. We're talking about somebody like the Prophet and him said, he really wanted to do evil, but then his conscience got the better of him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward him for something he didn't do even though this reward will not be given to somebody who didn't have that temptation. So for example, right now we're all sitting in this masjid. Alhamdulillah, none of us is drinking or committing any major sin. Are we getting reward for every single second that we're here by not committing a sin? We're getting reward for being in a masjid. We're getting reward for listening to Islam. Are we getting a reward for not committing a sin? No, because there was no desire. There was no choice. So my point here that I'm trying to stress that the majority opinion which found this phrase problematic, in fact, it is not problematic. And as I said, that sometimes some of our classical scholars, they tried to make prophets superhuman. They tried to make prophets above who they are. And Allah keeps on emphasizing prophets are human beings. No doubt they're the best. No doubt they're the elite. No doubt they do not commit major sins. But Yusuf did not commit a sin. And that's the whole point. So, in reality, there's nothing problematic at all with affirming exactly as Allah says, وَلَقَدْ هَمَّ بِهَا He also had a desire for her. And he also wanted to do something, but he saw the, the burhan or the clear evidence from his Lord. And we said that the strongest opinion about this burhan is that it refers to the knowledge of Yusuf. It refers to his prophethood. We move on now. وَاسْتَبَقَ الْبَابَ وَاسْتَبَقَ الْبَابَ the two of them raced for the door. And what this means is that when Yusuf said no, he must have turned around to leave. And again, as we said over and over again, the Quran does not provide details that are unnecessary. The Quran does not provide graphic detail because it is not appropriate to talk about this story in such explicit detail. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only tells us what we need to know. And we learn from this over and over again that these titillating details, these scandalous, if you like, stories, we shouldn't go and spread them, we shouldn't narrate them. We should keep it uh, Islamic and clean. If there is a moral, as in this story, even then there is no need to go into, as we say, juicy detail. But nonetheless, the message is given. And that is that Yusuf alayhi salam, so much is said that doesn't need to be said. And Allah azza wa jal, by these two words, that he gives us the whole picture. In one of them, the one, there's two people in the room, and the rooms are bolted, remember, وَغَلَّقَتِ abwab. All the doors, from the door of the house all the way to the bedroom, they have been shut, double shut. غَلَّقَتِ abwab. So Yusuf stands up to race out, and in his, inside of him, he's fleeing away from sin, away from fahsha. He's fleeing literally, physically, and spiritually away from this evil. And there is the wife of Aziz. There is his, his master's wife. And she is fleeing towards sin. The both are running physically in the same direction, but spiritually, emotionally, they are exactly opposite. She wants to reach the door before him so that she can bypass him to get to the door and once again attempt to seduce him. And she does not want him to open the door. So she wants to keep the door shut. And he's opening towards the door to open it and to exit. And in the process, His shirt was torn. Qadda means a slit occurred from the back. Meaning that in her zealousness, in her in her crazed mind, she held on to Yusuf's shirt and she's physically pushing him. She's physically begging him to come back into the room. And he's, in his eagerness to leave, he 
darted out and the shirt tore from the back. وَقَدَّ قَمِيصُهُ مِنْ جُبُرٍ وَأَلْفَ يَا سَيِّدَهَا لَدَ الْبَابِ And surprisingly, the word alfaya has this connotation of they didn't expect it. It was not something they were planning. And as we had said, that her plotting and her planning from the very beginning, everything it shows that she was not expecting anyone to return. And she had planned it in such a way that they had assumed that everything would be, she had assumed that everything would be fine for her. And just to be on the safe side, she adds a few extra locks. But suddenly, surprisingly, the husband returned home unannounced. Now notice here the beauty of the Quran. Allah says Sayyida Ha. Even though to say Sayyida Hu would be more appropriate here. And to say Zawja Ha would be more appropriate here. In other words, the man is the husband of this lady and the man is the master of Yusuf. So if Allah had said they found her husband at the door, it would have made sense. If Allah had said they found his master at the door, it would have made sense. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he kind of sort of merged the two together. And he said, they found her master, Sayyidaha. Even though, of course, it's not incorrect to call a husband a Sayyid, but technically speaking, the Sayyid means the master, right? And the man was more of a master to Yusuf than to his wife. You guys following this point, the Arabic point here? You guys following? That instead of saying her husband, or instead of saying his master, Allah said her master. And the, 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 the profundity here is to show how depraved she had become. That someone like her husband, who is in fact a type of figure, who is somebody she has to respect, somebody she has to give this authority to, she betrayed that trust. And so by calling the master here, by calling her husband her master, Allah is emphasizing what an evil act that she committed without being so explicit. As we said, Allah does not speak in fahsha. Allah does not speak in vulgarities. But by simply using the term her master, Allah is emphasizing how depraved was she. Even though the whole Quran doesn't say that, right? But the meaning is given. And as we said over and over again, this is the methodology of the Quran and of the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This also shows the importance of the husband by calling him Sayyid. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that if a woman protects her chastity and guards what, her, what Allah has protected and she is a good wife to her husband, she will enter Jannah from whatever door she pleases. In other words, protecting what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has protected. And this is one of the meanings of why Allah used the term master. So, They found their, her master at the door. قالت, immediately she said, What is possibly the penalty for somebody who wanted some evil on your wife? Except that he be put into jail or be punished. Now, this shows the immediate response, the simultaneous excuse that she invented. This shows her cunning nature. A more innocent person who is caught in this act, he would be speechless. A more innocent person would have no idea what to do. But her cunning mind is demonstrated. And we know this from our experiences in society that some people, they're very slick, we call them. Some people, they, they're able to get out of a different, difficult situation quite fast. And she is not expecting her husband. She hasn't calculated a plan B, right? Obviously not. If her husband actually entered the room and she was successful, can you imagine what would have happened? Right? If she had been successful and the husband came in, well, you know, she's basically uh, going to be killed or something. So she, there's no question she's not planning for the husband to come back. The immediate instantaneous excuse shows her, if you like, cunning mind. And many times this cunning minds, they can be used for good, but she uses it for the evil. That instantaneously she thinks of an excuse. And she says, what is the punishment of someone who intended evil against your wife? Notice she doesn't say someone who intended the act. She doesn't say someone who intended to, let's say, rape or something. She doesn't use a word. She simply says, unevil. Su'an. 
also notice she cannot accuse Yusuf of doing a crime. She accuses him of wanting to do a crime. Man arada bi ahlika su'an. Because, number of reasons. Firstly, nothing's actually happened. Secondly, if she says something's happened, well, she's also in trouble. Right? If she says something's happened, then she's also in trouble. So she doesn't accuse Yusuf of actually committing a sin. She simply accuses Yusuf of wanting to commit a sin. Man arada bi ahlika su'an. Illa an yusjana aw adhabun alim. Now, of course, it is the methodology of uh, the people of Lum, the people of wrong, to accuse others of injustice. This is a standard tactic. You accuse others of doing an evil. You, and Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran that one of the worst sins is to accuse an innocent person of a crime. This is a major sin according to the text of the Quran. To accuse an innocent person of a crime, this is something that she has fallen into and this is one of the problems of committing sins. When you commit sins, we already talked about the brothers of Yusuf getting into more and more sins. Now we look at the wife of Aziz. She wanted to commit one sin. She ends up committing 10, 15 sins. She wanted to do one evil. Now she has to cover up her tracks and she has to lie and she has to do this and that. And because of her lies, eventually, as we know, Yusuf ends up in jail. And this is one of the problems, brothers and sisters, of committing sins. Shaitan comes and says, come on, just do one sin, no big deal. But there's no such thing as one sin. Every sin is a domino. Every sin leads to other sins. So her intention to commit an evil now causes her, forces her to commit slander. Forces her to go the next level. And it will go, force her to go again and again, as we're going to see more and more. So she says immediately that he is the one who intended to do an evil. And it is not only this woman who accuses falsely. Wallahi, it is the methodology of every wrongdoer, starting from Iblis. Starting from Iblis. When Iblis did not prostrate to Adam alayhi salam, he immediately accused Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He immediately accused Allah. And he said, Oh Allah, you're the one. Qala Rabbi bima Oh Allah, you're the one who caused me to go astray. He couldn't take the blame himself. Blaming other people is a sign of satanic tendencies. Blaming other people for your own sin, this is of the earliest evils that we have recorded in human history. So, uh, uh, she says that Yusuf intended to do some harm to me. Now, just as a side point, an interesting tidbit, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu on his deathbed, he accused some of his wives of being like these women of Yusuf. And this led to a huge, like not controversy, but what does this mean? What does this mean they are like the wives of Yusuf? The story is that when, when the Prophet was about to pass away, now realize that nobody knew that he was going to die. They expected this to be a bad sickness and he'd recover. But during the very last days of his life, literally two days or three days before he passed away, his sickness really did get very bad. And it was so bad that he could not leave, lead the salah. He could not lead the salah. And you can imagine when the Prophet ﷺ is there, nobody dares to lead the salah in his presence. And if he comes late to the masjid, everybody waits for him. Can you imagine? He's not just any imam. He is Rasulullah. So nobody has ever led salah in masjid Nabi other than the Prophet ﷺ, unless he's not physically present in Medina. Then he would tell Ubay ibn Ka'b, he would tell Ibn Umm Maktoum to be the imam. But never has the Prophet ﷺ prayed in his own masjid with somebody else leading the salah. Obviously, can you imagine? It's not even logical to think like that, right? So, he tried to stand up to go to pray, and he fell down unconscious. They threw some water on him. They, they, he, he commanded that he do, will do again. They tried again, he fell down. For the third time, when he could not make up, he's physically weak, he said, go tell Abu Bakr to lead the salah. Muru Abu Bakrin fal yusalli bin nas. Go tell Abu Bakr to lead the salah. Now, he's in the, whose house is he in? Aisha, he's in his Aisha's house. He passes away in Aisha's house. So Aisha is the one taking the command. Aisha does not want to tell her father to lead the salah. Why? Because she's dreading that this might be the last few days of the Prophet Sallallahu And Abu Bakr will be for the first time in the history of Medina. The Pro Abu Bakr will be leading the prayer and the Prophet Sallallahu is in his house. And if he were to pass away in that time, Aisha is thinking a different way. She is thinking people will associate Abu Bakr and his imamat with the death of the Prophet 
Because that's going to be, if you like, a direct, not a causal relationship, but a, a, a direct, if you like, indicator. The only time Abu Bakr is leading the prayer is when the Prophet ﷺ basically passes away. That's what Aisha is worried about. And she's worried that for the rest of Abu Bakr's life, he will always be associated with the death of the Prophet ﷺ. Now, regardless of how true or not that was, that's her mentality, right? So she said, Ya Rasulullah, why don't you tell Hafsa to tell Umar? You're married to Hafsa as well. Go tell Hafsa, or should I tell Hafsa? Maybe she can ask Umar to lead the salah. Let somebody else lead, not my father, because Aisha is Abu Bakr's daughter, right? So she kept on insisting, and he kept on insisting, until finally he said, go command him to lead the salah. Wallahi, you are like the women of Yusuf. You are like the sawahib of Yusuf. Now, how is Aisha like the women of Yusuf? Scholars have tried to read in, but it seems like it's pretty clear. It seems like all the Prophet understood that she's attempting to blame somebody else, i.e. Hafsa and Umar. She's attempting to shift the blame. And she doesn't want to take any quote-unquote responsibility, if you like. So the Prophet ﷺ saw through her plot and he accused her of being like the women of Yusuf, meaning that you are thinking that you'll get out of it. You're thinking that you're by accusing other people or by shifting the blame, things will get better. So he called her the, you are like the companions of Yusuf. This is a side point because he used the phrase, the female companions of Yusuf, and this is what that uh, refers to. So the wife of Aziz says that what is the punishment of somebody? who attempted to do evil, except that you put him in jail or you punish him severely. Now, for any man to attempt evil on any woman is a sin. But especially for a slave, especially for a slave, and especially against his own master's wife, this would have been a very evil crime. And so she's saying something has to be done. You have to punish him or torture him or throw him in jail. إِلَّا أَنْ يُسْجَنْ أَوْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ Immediately, Yusuf السلام, responds. And Yusuf says, قَالَ هِيَ رَاوَدَتْنِي عَنْ نَفْسِي Yusuf said, she was the one who attempted to seduce me. Now, notice, Yusuf السلام, immediately defends himself. He does not allow the accusation to go unchallenged. And this shows us that it is the least we can say it is permissible to defend your honor and reputation. Now later on in the story, Yusuf will be charged with another crime and he does not defend his honor. And he remains silent. And that shows us it is also permissible to remain silent. You look at the situation, your honor will be dishonored if you like. You will be accused of crimes. People will say bad things about you. This is human nature. At times, you should respond back. If the situation dictates, you stand up and defend yourself. And at times, there's no need to. At times, you don't have to do so. You look at the overall situation, and it is not wajib to defend your honor each and every time. So Yusuf السلام, in this situation, in this scenario, he defends. Later on, we were gonna come in a few weeks, inshallah, another story of Yusuf السلام, he's accused of something else, he remains quiet, and he doesn't, accuse, and he doesn't defend himself. And we'll show once again that it is permissible to defend your honor. It is per permissible to remain silent. And the irony here, he defends his honor when he's a slave. And when he's the minister, he doesn't defend his honor. When he's accused of stealing, uh, uh, his brothers accuse, accuse him of stealing. When they, when they say that Binyamin, when the, Binyamin was found with the cup, what do they say? They say, if he's a thief, his brother was a thief as well. Right? Allah says in the Quran that when they found Binyamin with the cup, the, the other brothers say, if he is stolen, his brother has stolen as well. And Yusuf did not respond back to that charge. So, subhanAllah, at times of da'af, at times of lowliness, Yusuf valued that honor and wanted to defend it. Why? Because being charged with the crime at that time would be physically harmful. At times of izza and power, when his brother said something, it's not going to harm him. It's not going to harm him. In fact, to expose himself at that time will be more problematic. And so he didn't defend himself and he let it slide. He let it go. So subhanAllah, Yusuf السلام, looked at the consequences. Right now, I need to defend. Right now, I need to be on the defensive. And from this, what we can learn is when Islam is attacked, and Islam is always going to be attacked. People will always make fun of Islam. People will always find problems with Islam. 
and with Muslims. At times, really, it is almost wajib to stand up and defend, especially at times of weakness and humiliation, because we need that honor, we need that izzah. And at times when Islam is at its izzah and glory, and some nobody comes and starts blaspheming, what do we care? He's not going to harm anything, right? So it looks at the situation you're in. In this case, Yusuf السلام, immediately responds back. And he says, قَالَ هِيَ رَاوَدَتْنِي عَنْ نَفْسِي she was the one who sought to seduce me. Now notice Yusuf accuses her of a specific crime. Not general like she did. She said he wanted to do some bad. He wanted to do some evil. She doesn't specify what. Yusuf is specific. She attempted to seduce me. And generally speaking, the one who accuses specific crimes knows more about what's happening and is more truthful than the one who responds in generalities. She's speaking in generalities. He's speaking in specifics. And human nature, psychology, the one who speaks specifics, the one who tells you the details, the one who tells you all of the tafasil, he knows what's going on. And he's the one truthful. And the one who denies, oh, no, no, nothing happened. Oh, I really don't know what he's talking about. Generally speaking, human nature is you deny in this type of manner. So Yusuf السلام, accuses her of a specific crime. Now, interesting thing here. Yusuf says, she attempted to seduce me. And he didn't accuse her in the first person. You attempted to seduce me. Rather, he speaks in the third person even though she's standing in front of him. Now some scholars have derived, and I don't see any problem with this derivation. Some scholars have derived that even though she's the criminal, and even though she is the one doing this evil, nonetheless, in the end of the day, she is a woman and she deserves some modicum of respect. And she deserves a little bit of karama, a little bit of, uh, of, of not being so accusatory that you are the one who did this. Rather, he appeals to the husband as if she's not here, as if she's not present. And he speaks to the husband in the third person. That, or the second person in English, sorry. She was the one who attempted to seduce me. And Allah knows best. It does make sense that there is a reason why Yusuf didn't choose the direct, even though she's standing right there. And he speaks to the husband as if she's not present here. She is the one who attempted to seduce me. Now, in the end of the day, th there, there are two people, each one accusing the other of the crime. And here is the husband, the master, the Aziz, he has to make a decision. On what will he make a decision? How will he base this decision on? And every single day we are, we are, if you like, also put in a situation of making decisions. We also have to figure out, people are lying around us, people are telling the truth in our jobs, in our social networks, in our family areas, everything, these things happen. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَشَهِدَ شَاهِدٌ مِّنْ أَهْلِهَا a witness from her family testified, saying, "In kana qamisuhu qudda min qubulin, fasadaqat wa huwa min al kathibin." So, it is clear that the torn shirt is lying on the floor. It is clear that they can see the shirt has been torn. So, somebody testifies and says, "This torn shirt, if the shirt has been torn from the front." then she's the one telling the truth, that he attempted to seduce her, and he is a liar. Why? Obviously, because if a man is attacking the woman, then if she's defending herself, which side will she be defending? The front of the man. She's going to be defending from the front of the man. So if she pulls something or fights something, the front of the shirt will be torn. وَإِن كَانَ قَمِيصُهُ قُدَّ مِن دُبُرٍ فَكَذَبَتْ وَهُوَ مِنَ الصَّادِقِ And if the shirt has been torn from the back, then she is the one that's telling a lie and he is the one that is speaking the truth. Now, this phrasing has a number of issues and benefits here. First and foremost, Allah says, وَشَهِدَ شَاهِدٌ مِنْ أَهْلِهَا So the first question that arises, who is this shahid? Here, so many mufassirun have given Again, so many stories. Some of them said that it was a supernatural testimony. Some of them even said that the shirt began to speak, even though the Quran has no such indication. And clearly, it's a human being because Allah says, someone from her family. And the shirt is not from her family. 
right? But sometimes the scholars of tafsir, they went into a little bit too much imaginative detail. Uh, it is reported that some of the Sahaba and Tabi'un, they said that this is a baby that spoke from the cradle. A baby of one of the servants, a baby of one of the members of the household, obviously not their child, they don't have a child, right? Uh, Aziz and his wife don't have a child. That's why Aziz said that we might want to adopt him. So some scholars said, and it is reported, some uh, Ibn Abbas it is said also said this, that this was a baby. And they bring a hadith. They bring a hadith which says, four people spoke from the grave. Sorry, four children, not the grave. Four children. There's another hadith about the grave. I'm getting messed up. Four children spoke from the cradle. Four children spoke from the cradle. And... One of them is, of course, uh, Isa alayhi salam. One of them is the boy of the uh, the boy of the prostitute who attempted to seduce Juraj. The story of Juraj. One of them is the uh, son of the one who used to comb the hair of Pharaoh's daughter. And one of them, they say, is this one which is the shahid of Yusuf alayhi salam. So this is a hadith that allegedly says this. The majority, this hadith is not mentioned in the six books, it's mentioned in the more obscure books. The majority of scholars say this hadith is not authentic. Rather, this hadith is a statement of Ibn Abbas. And later, narrators mistakenly raised it to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The Prophet didn't say this. An authentic hadith in Sahih Bukhari says, Three children spoke from the cradle. And there are three minus the shahid of Yusuf, right? We mentioned the three. So the authentic hadith says three spoke from the cradle. This hadith is in Bukhari. We have no doubt about it. Clearly three people spoke from the cradle, right? Number one, Isa alayhi salam. Number two, the child in the story of Juraj, George, Juraj. And number three, the, uh, the, the son uh, or the daughter of the woman who used to comb the hair of the daughter of Fir'aun. Ibn to Mashitati Fir'aun, right? So, uh, Ibn to Fir'aun, sorry. So, the, you know the story of the, the, these three, we don't have time to get into all of these stories, but when Fir'aun wanted to uh, kill all of the people, all of the male children, so one of them, and, and all of the people who believed in Musa, uh, one of them was this Miss the, 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 the one who used to comb the hair, she had accepted Islam. She was a follower of the Prophet. And when Fir'aun attempted to kill her with her child, she almost stopped and she said, let me go back to the religion. But the child spoke from the grave, or keep on saying grave here. The child spoke from the cradle, from, from her hand. And the child said, proceed, O mother, you're upon the truth. This hadith is in Bukhari. So we have these three children that spoke from the cradle. Ibn Abbas has four people spoke from the cradle and he adds Shahid the Shahid from Yusuf. Uh, and th that's why it became a very popular uh, cons misconception, if you like. And I say it is a misconception because the fact of the matter is the wording of the Quran indicates that there's nothing, there's nothing that is that supernatural about the Shahid. In other words, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, if, if a child spoke, there would be no reason to say a witness from her family said. It would have been a miracle in and of itself. Additionally, what did the witness say? The witness said a simple rule. If the shirt is broken or torn from the front versus the shirt torn from the back. Now, if a child speaks, it's a miracle. It doesn't need to give you rules. So if it were a child, the child would not have to go into the rules of law. You guys following me, right? If it were a child, the child speaks. Khalas, we know Yusuf is telling the truth. You, you see my point here. So really it makes no sense to say that this was a baby. Rather, it was an elderly man. It was a normal, basically human being. Most likely a cousin or some relative of hers. How do we know it's a relative? Allah says so. Min ahliha. Why does Allah say min ahliha? To show us that he had no bias against her. If anything, his bias was for her. Right? Generally speaking, people of a family stick together. Right? Generally speaking, people of a family help one another out. So Allah is saying, this was a man from her family. He's not a biased person. He's not somebody who had a vendetta. He's not somebody who had a grudge. Generally, he should have supported her. The fact that he's making this statement shows he's neutral. Shows he's looking for the truth. وَشَهِدَ شَاهِدٌ مِنْ أَهْلِهَا 
Somebody testified from her house. Now, here raises a very interesting question. Allah says, a witness testified from her family. Was he a witness? Was he a witness? No. Allah uses the word shahid. What does shahid mean? Somebody who saw shahada, right? Now, in this case, the man obviously did not witness anything. How can Allah call him a shahid when he's not a physical shahid? You guys following the question here, right? Now, he's an expert witness. Huh? This, is, this is a modern terminology. It's just not something that uh, the, the shahid would not be used in the Arabic language for this. Now, some scholars have said that Allah called him a shahid even though he wasn't a shahid because Allah was a shahid and what the man said was the truth so he might as well have been a witness. You guys following that? Allah was the shahid and the man spoke the truth so Allah is testifying that this guy spoke the truth even though the man is not a shahid. Others have said that Allah called him a shahid because he gave a simple rule. So I guess your point indirectly comes in. Okay? I guess your point indirectly comes in. He gave, <laughs> mashallah, absolutely, khalas. We'll, okay, we'll give you. Your, your point comes in. So Allah, some people have said Allah called him a shahid because he gave a simple rule. The rule being valid, regardless of who's right and wrong. So Allah called him a shahid because the rule was a valid rule. What was the rule? In kana qamizuhu quddamin qubulin. So he begins with her innocence because he wants her to be innocent. The first half of the rule is for her benefit. Let's hope that his shirt is torn from the, from the front. He wants him to be the liar and her to be the one who's safe. And this shows that he's a shahid min ahliha. This shows he's a shahid that is neutral, is unbiased. If anything, he wants his own cousin or his own, his own relative to be scot-free. وَشَهِدَ شَاهِدٌ مِّنْ أَهْلِهَا إِنْ كَانَ قَمِيسُ قُدَّ مِنْ قُبُلٍ فَصَدَقَتْ وَهُوَ مِنَ الْكَاذِبِينَ If the shirt is torn, now, قُدَّ here, uh, the, 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 the precise meaning only Allah knows, but it doesn't look like there was a physical, uh, there was a physical tear on the, on the ground. In other words, it doesn't look like the, tore, the, the, the shirt tore a piece. Rather, there was a tear within the shirt. That the shirt itself had torn in a horizontal manner. Or, sorry, in a, in a vertical manner. Qudda. This is the, 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 the general connotation. So, the man is saying, we know that his shirt has been torn. How did they know that? Perhaps the outer shirt was on the floor. Perhaps this was given in the conversation that Allah did not mention. We can only assume. We don't know. How did they know that the shirt was torn? So he gives the testimony. Let us examine the shirt. And let us see if the shirt is torn from the front or from the back. Now, this clearly shows us that in Islamic law, it is permissible to pay, base judgment and testimony on what we call in English circumstantial evidence. And this is a controversial point. I don't want to go into too much detail in fiqh, but most of our scholars in our history have said that for any crime to be prosecuted, you must have two adult witnesses, except for the crime of zina, which requires four. You all know that. Otherwise, you require two adult witnesses who saw the crime. According to that law, fingerprints or video testimonials or this or that would not be considered valid in a court of law. Now, in, and of course in those days when they formulated law, they didn't have fingerprints, they didn't have all of this detective sciences, you understand this point, right? So the Sharia came and it said two witnesses. Now, there were a very few people, of them is Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Qayyim, and these were intellectual giants thinking outside the box all the time. They argued that, well, two witnesses are good, but it's not necessary. If there is enough evidence, circumstantial, that clearly shows that the crime occurred, if there are a number of evidences besides two witnesses, not every crime has two witnesses, right? Not every crime has two witnesses. What if we don't have the two witnesses? Are we allowed to base a verdict on other types of evidence? Now, believe it or not, mainstream fiqh would say, no, we're not. 
mainstream fiqh because they still require the two witnesses. But there's always been a healthy minority and in our times many of the Islamic rule, judge, uh, judges across the Muslim world, many of them, not all, I would, I, even to say majority would be wrong, perhaps the majority still follow that rule in Islamic law, but many of them are arguing for Ibn Taymiyyah ibn Qayyim's position, which is that you look at DNA evidence, you look at fingerprints, you look at uh, basically detective work, you know, you see what other issues have happened and let us see if we can narrow it down and let's see if we can pronounce a verdict on that. And this incident here would be used as one evidence that shows you can use supporting evidence because Allah called it a shahada even though it wasn't a shahada, right? This is the key that Ibn Qayyim uses. Allah called it a testimony even though it wasn't a eyewitness testimony. So uh, the... So over here, the man gives his general rule. And that is, look at the front, look at the back of the shirt, and let us see uh, which of these two was the more, uh, was, was torn. Now, there's other circumstantial evidence as well, which a number of scholars mention. And this helps to make Yusuf's case more solid. Of them is that Yusuf is a slave. And generally speaking, generally speaking, slaves would never have the audacity to commit this type of crime. This is a very unheard of thing. Even in Jahili and early Islamic society, still the concept of a slave, yani the, the way people looked at slaves, they were literally, astaghfirullah, but that's the way they looked at them, subhuman. Or looking at them as not fully human. So they don't have these desires, they wouldn't dare do this, or else they'd be in serious trouble. So the fact that Yusuf is making this accusation really shows that this is not, this is a very big thing. And it would be very difficult for society to imagine a slave attempting to do this. Number two, Yusuf is the one seen exiting the door first. Number three, the wife of Aziz is dressed up and perfumed. And it's obvious that this doesn't make sense, that if she is the one saying that, and because she had prepared, or right? I'm ready for you, I'm prepared for you. So clearly she's prepared herself, decorated herself, perfumed herself, wearing those types of attire. So this sends off warning bells as well. Number four, Yusuf alayhi salam has been living in the house for so many years. And his character, his conduct, his akhlaq are well known. And this is not ever expected from him. And number five, we already gave one point away and that is Yusuf accuses her of a specific crime. Whereas she accuses him of a generic crime. And generally speaking, the one with the more knowledge is the one who's more truthful. Yusuf accuses her of seducing. And she says he wanted to do some evil. And generally speaking, this shows who's, who has the more authority. So, these are other factors, other qara'in. The Arabic word is qadina or qara'in. That shows who's telling the truth. Now, before we move on, an interesting motif. Two motifs. Racing and shirts. We have seen this before. Racing, where did the first race allegedly occur? It didn't actually occur, right? But the brothers said, we went racing. And they then brought back the shirt. And the scholars say it was the shirt that alerted Yaqub to the fact that his children were lying. Remember we talked about this, right? The shirt was bloodstained without one single scratch on it, right? And Yaqub said, what a... What a gentle wolf this was, that it ate up Yusuf without touching him, right? So the shirt saved Yusuf's memory in Yaqub's mind. And here, once again, there's a racing and there's a shirt. And the shirt saves Yusuf's reputation. So there is this motif of, of Surah Yusuf, of the shirt being uh, uh, symbolic, if you like, in this regard. And of course, it is literal and that there was a literal shirt here. When they all saw, so there's four people here now, right? The wife of Aziz, Aziz, Yusuf, and the witness. There's four people here. When they all saw that his shirt had been torn from the back, he said, this is of your plotting. Your plotting is indeed very mighty. It's very powerful. In other words, so now the husband knows he's not supposed to be back at this time. The husband knows the doors, doors have been extra locked, right? All of these are qara'in. All of these are, are hints now. Now all the alarm bells start running off. Everything fits into place. 
So he said, what a dastardly plot. What an evil plot. You did all of this. This is of your plot. Indeed, your plot is very mighty. Now, one of the scholars of the old, he gave a, a comment. Allah knows, did he mean it in joke or not? Uh, but we will take it as a joke, inshallah. And that is, he said, when Allah described shaitan and the plotting of shaitan in Surah An-Nisa verse 76, Allah says, Inna kayda shaytani kana, kana da'ifa. The plotting of shaitan is very weak. And when Allah describes the plotting of women, he says, Inna kayda kunna azim. That the plotting of women is a very big thing. So one of the scholars of the Tabi'un, he said, I fear women more than I fear the shaitan. Because the plotting of shaitan is weak, but the plotting of women is mighty. Now we hope he meant it in jest, but perhaps what can be derived is that uh, the seduction of women is far more difficult for a man to repel and to save himself from on average than most of the seductions of shaitan and this is something that I think everybody would understand and agree to so the husband realizes his wife is lying and he tells her uh, he tells Yusuf yeah, Yusuf an hadha. oh Yusuf turn away from this kunti minal Yusuf an hadha. Yusuf turn away from this turn away from this meaning don't tell anybody ignore it Imagine that this never happened. There's only four people, right? It's a small thing now. And I know I'm not going to tell anybody what happened. I know my wife's not going to tell anybody. I trust this man because he's a part of her family and she would not, he would not bring dishonor to his own family, right? What man is going to say that somebody in my own family did this, right? So the only person left is Yusuf. Yusuf, you turn away from this. Imagine it never happened. And as for you, Ask forgiveness for your sins. Make up for this sin. You were of those who committed a major sin. You were of those who committed some type of mistake. Now, question arises, why did the husband basically let her off with a tap on the wrist? I mean, this is a serious crime here. May Allah protect all of us, but any man, Muslim or non-Muslim, if he found even a fraction, even a portion of this from his own wife, you can imagine what would happen right so why did this man overlook all of this scholars have struggled to come up with a reason some of them have said he was an imbecile completely out of it right this doesn't make any sense because he clearly understands what's going on and he pronounces a verdict he knows who's right and wrong others have said he simply had a too soft of a heart too innocent of a heart and he didn't think it would get any worse but again he accuses his wife of plotting a, a heinous crime, of plotting an evil plot, saying this is a major plot. And he says, you've committed a sin, you know, seek forgiveness. So that doesn't make sense either. Some of them have said, it seems like he had lack of ghira. Ghira means uh, a type of jealousy that a husband feels for his wife, a protective jealousy. So some have said that he had a lack of ghira. But once again, the fact that he's angry, the fact that he's showing that he is very hurt again this doesn't make sense to me the the opinion that really resonates with me and Allah Azza wa knows best and it makes complete sense from what we know of human psychology the reason why he wanted to keep this affair secret this matter secret was because it harmed his own reputation because he had his own ego because he had his own prestige in society and scholars point out the dangers of one's ego, the dangers of one's prestige, that you're willing to allow filth to corrupt your own household as long as it's private. I cannot allow the people to speak about me. And we know in our times, every single person, this is one of the problems of the rich and the famous. This is one of the problems that they are willing to overlook a lot of filth and, and, and evil as long as it doesn't get into the public eye. As long as it remains private. And they'll go to bribery and corruption and scandal. They'll do a lot worse just so that it's not printed in the media. right? So and this is, I think, a very logical reason why we can say that the husband uh, here, the Aziz, he simply took, uh, uh, undertook no action. The main point that comes to his mind is what will people say? What will people think? 
my, this going to destroy my reputation, my honor. So I cannot, uh, I cannot let this continue. And so he simply said, Yusuf, turn away from here. Perhaps, perhaps he reassigned the household chores that Yusuf, you don't do this anymore. You don't come here anymore. And he tried to reprimand, reprimand his wife internally. But it is clear here, no matter what you say, though, at the end of the day, it's clear he underestimated her passion. And he thought that, khalas, this was a one-time mistake. It's not going to happen again. Because no matter how, if you like, eager you are to protect your reputation, in the end, he didn't sell Yusuf. He didn't get rid of Yusuf. He didn't do something that was more drastic. He did not fully take into account. He underestimated the danger of the situation. Another interesting point here is that Aziz and his wife are not Muslim. Yet he tells her, استغفري لذنبكي Seek forgiveness for the sin that you have committed. So he wants her to seek forgiveness from his gods, not from him. He's already, he's, that's a different story. He's saying, استغفري, seek forgiveness for your sin. So he knows that infidelity is a sin, despite the fact that they don't believe in our sharia. And subhanAllah, it is amazing that to this day, people consider so many fahsha to be permissible premarital and in our days we have the same genders all of them doing whatever they want everything is now permissible you know this right but the one thing that is impermissible is extramarital think about this you cannot marry more than one. Oh, god forbid you cannot you cannot uh, uh, um, or, or sorry you can engage in premarital premarital is now completely permissible right premarital is not even a sin at all uh, with the same gender, completely permissible. No big deal. No, it's anybody who opposes it, you're the backward person. You're the person with negative stereotypes, right? All of this is completely okay, legit. Astaghfirullah, they even have group now partners and whatnot if you're not married. The key is, you're not married. Once you get married, they don't have a sharia, this society. But once you get married, khalas. The big sin is infidelity, Right? having an affair. And subhanAllah, this is ingrained in human fitrah. It's ingrained in human beings that you do not cheat, you do not go outside the bounds of the bonds of marriage. And therefore, even in their old, in their old customs and culture of Egypt, the husband did not appreciate this. He said, you have to make it up to our gods. And you also have to uh, get, forgive, uh, or, or, um, uh, seek forgiveness. You are of those who committed a sin. Uh, so when this occurs now, We'll just do one more ayah, inshallah, then we'll open the floor for, for question. وَقَالَ نِسْوَةٌ فِي الْمَدِينَةِ The women of the city began speaking. What did they say? إِمْرَأَةُ الْعَزِيزِ تُرَاوِدُ فَتَاهَا عَنْ نَفْسِهِ The wife of Aziz is attempting to seduce her own slave. She is attempting to seduce her own slave. قَدْ شَغَفَهَا حُبَّهَا she has loved him a violent love, a passionate love. We see her to be in such manifest and clear error. So despite the attempts of Aziz to keep the matter hush-hush, to keep it quiet, nonetheless the news spreads. And subhanAllah, this is the sunnah of Allah Azza wa Jal. Sunnah kawniya, meaning this is what happens. That this type of gossip, of slander, of innuendos, people just love to spread about it. How did people find out? Most scholars, they say that the, the household of Yusuf, the slaves in the house other than these four, that they don't blame any of these four. And of course, we know Yusuf would not have said anything. Aziz, the, Aziz himself was too embarrassed to. The wife of Aziz uh, would not, obviously. And the shahid was from her own family. So most likely, the news spread in the... Uh, uh, amongst the slaves of the house other than Yusuf, right? And it might have been also that uh, in her passion, she's so obvious in her flirtations with Yusuf that the other slaves clearly see this, right? So they might not know the full details, they might not know of that incident, but they do know that she is in love with Yusuf. So the other slaves spread it, and the slaves spread it to the other slaves' households, and then when their slaves spread it to the mistresses and the masters, so slowly but surely, gossip spreads. And as we said, gossip is the bane of society. Gossip is the social network of society, right? Every society, every society is immersed in gossip. And often, 
gossip it spreads and as it spreads it gets bigger and larger as it spreads a small tail is made 10 times larger and that is why in our sharia gossips and slanders and backbitings and all of these types of things the door has been shut and sealed in our sharia we don't get involved with any of this and gossip is of many types in the sharia subhanallah it's not even one type there's ghibah, there's, there's namima, there's buhdan. All of this comes under types of gossip. Ghiba means, as we know, you say something about someone in his absence that he doesn't like. Even, and even if this is the truth, this is going to be called ghibah. You say the truth. Oh, you know this guy, he did this and that. What you say is true. This is ghibah. You're putting him down. You're mocking him. You're making fun of him. You're spreading something that he does not like to be mentioned in his absence. This is called ghibah. And we know the punishment for ghibah and we know that it is one of the sins that will be punished in the adab uh, al-qabr, in the punishment of the grave. And we know what Allah has called it in the Quran and compared it in the Quran. Worse than this is buhtan. And buhtan means you spread a blatant lie about somebody. This is a slander. And that's worse than ghibah. Ghibah means you're telling the truth. And spreading the ghiba and namima back to the person is called, sorry, sorry ghiba and buhtan, back to the person is called namima. There's a third category, namima. Namima means, so you're in a gathering here. Somebody mentions, let's say, uh, brother, let's say, uh, mention a name here. Brother Yasser, let's say, khalas. He mentions brother Yasser, okay? Now I'm not here. And he starts saying something about me or about anybody called Yasir that he shouldn't say in public. Okay, I wasn't here. The damage has been, that has been done is between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, somebody comes back to me and says, Oh, you know what? You know what happened in that gathering? You weren't there. Ah, let me tell you what happened. Fulan ibn Fulan, he said this about you. You know that? Now you tell me how am I going to feel? The damage is done when? The news comes back to me, correct? This is called namima. The one who tells the news back to you, even that is haram. Even that is haram. The wajib or the obligation, you defend the brother in his absence. When riba is done, you defend in his absence. Or buhtan is done, you defend him. The least you should do is to remain quiet and hated in your heart. There's no iman lesser than this. For you to go back and spread the news to him, intending to cause damage, right? Intending to cause damage between the two people, this is called namima. And namima is one of those things the Prophet ﷺ told us about the punishments of the namam. And the Prophet ﷺ said, the one who does this will not enter Jannah. The one, his habit is to go, and this is not somebody who's doing the ghibah. There's not somebody who's doing the botan. All he's doing, he's being truthful. But there's no need to spread this truth, is there? Right? What is your niyyah for spreading this? Now, I don't want to go into a long fiqh discussion. Once in a while, some exceptional scenarios, there is a reason to go and tell the person. It's exceptional scenarios, right? But, or the better thing to do is to cause reconciliation. If there are people fighting or are having a problem, then you get in the middle and solve the problem. But to get in the middle, to cause damage. This person, the Prophet ﷺ said, لا يدخل الجنة قتات. The one who goes and he tries to break these friendships, he will not enter Jannah. So the one who makes it a habit to spread namima, this person and his reason for doing so is to cause problems in society. This person has a major threat of being punished in the fire of hell. And this is very relevant in every single society, it's relevant to the story here. It shows us human nature. We can talk about it in the story of the slander of Aisha as well. In the slander of Aisha, when the munafiqun said something about Aisha, Allah criticized the munafiqun for saying it. And then Allah criticized the Sahaba for spreading it. Both are worthy of criticism. The first group Allah said will go to Naru Jahannam. You invented a blatant lie. If they don't repent, Allah says they will go to the fire of hell. The second group, Allah says, why didn't you keep quiet? Why didn't you keep your mouths shut? Why did you throw it from tongue to tongue? Allah says, إِذْ تَلَقَّوْنَهُ بِأَلْسِنَتِكُمْ Talaqqa means, 
it came to your tongue, you threw it back at somebody. It came to, so it's as if Allah is giving an imagery that this evil um, uh, rumor, it spread from tongue to tongue like wildfire. Allah says, why did you do it? Why did you have to go and tell other people? You should have simply stayed quiet and said, Subhanaka hadha buhtanun azim. This is an evil lie. I'm not going to say anything. Just be quiet about this. And this shows us again and again that a Muslim society, a Muslim character, a Muslim akhlaq, it rises above gossip. It rises above innuendo and slander. A Muslim does not get involved in these matters. And the Prophet ﷺ said that of the perfection of one's Islam is that he leaves what doesn't concern him. Of the perfection of one's Islam is that you leave what does not concern you. If somebody comes and tells you, oh, so-and-so said this, you say, don't, I don't need to know, why are you telling me? And you don't go and tell other people. Once one of the famous scholars of the past, somebody came running up to him and said, Sheikh, do you know, Sheikh, do you know, so-and-so he said that about you. So-and-so said that about you. The scholar said, didn't shaitan find somebody better than you to use as his messenger to come and tell me? Couldn't shaitan, so he criticized him. Couldn't shaitan find somebody better than you to come and spread problems between me and my brother? You are Rasul of shaitan basically. When you come and tell me this, you are Rasul of shaitan. My point is, brothers and sisters, wallah, it's human nature that gossip spreads. And it will exist ila yawm al qiyamah. It is human nature. Every one of us should strive to overcome it in his or her personal life. Every one of us should strive to rise above gossip in our daily life. And in particular, and I have to say this because Allah Azza wa Jal Himself says this, in the context of Surah Hujurat, which talks about buhtan and spreading gossip and whatnot, Allah specifically mentions women. Because, وَقَالَ نِسْوَةٌ فِي الْمَدِينَةٍ Because it is true, and I'm not making a, a, a sexist statement, but it is true that generally speaking, women are more involved with gossip and with spreading these types of tales than men are. And even over here, it was the women who did the talking. وَقَالَ نِسْوَةٌ فِي الْمَدِينَةٍ And in Surah Hujurat, Allah Azza wa has a specific commandment. Generally, Allah only speaks in the masculine because it suffices. But when it comes to this topic, specifically Allah mentions in Surah Hujurat, uh, the issue of women. And this is because we know uh, from experience, and this is just a simple fact, that this is something that is more predominant. That women do talk about other women and other groups and other people in matters that are simply not a, uh, beneficial. لا يزال الخير حيا لا يزال إن في الدنيا سلاما وظلال أخبر الأيام أنها في وصال قم بنا وانظر لآيات الجمال قم بنا وانظر لآيات الجمال